that's a smart idea. And, you know, the, the, by the way, whenever I say, you know, it's like, um, <laughs> that's your key in the drinking game to, okay. to have another drink instead of, um, sure. or, uh, I say, you know, in our Hebrew class, you know, we had, um, you know, first come across this word, um, uh, shakar, this word for strong drink as they like to, um, cast it in English. Uh, but okay. we call it beer, right? And it, it goes yeah, back yeah. to, you know, in the, in the cognate languages, we know it as beer. And so uh, I don't know what the purpose of that was, if it was like a, a King James thing, or if it's something that um, goes across the different, like from, let's say, Latin, um, you know, and all the other European languages, are they translated as beer, strong drink? Um, sure. I just know the English issue is on the one side, it's strong drink mm -hmm. and, um, you know, we can keep wine in there because at least it's used eucharistically, right? It's used, um, traditionally for the, uh, the service, you know, of the offering, but beer isn't <laughs> right. Melchizedek now doesn't offer beer. And <laughs> I'm wondering if it's Thai, if it's related, um, to, uh, you know, the Indian um, uh, version of Alexander the Great, uh, Ashoka the Great? <clears throat> oh, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm wondering if there, if if his name is similar, if there's a strength, you know, in his name and it's similar uh, to, um, you know, the, uh, you said a, a Ashukur for strong drink? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, Shekhar, that's basically, Shekhar, okay. you know, how we, how we phrase it. Um, meaning, um, I mean, it's beer, right? It's from Shikaru. Shikaru is the Akkadian form of it. Okay. Um, and, you know, or I just wonder if it goes back to like people not wanting to drink or they like they want to put beer, let's say, in a separate category than um, wine, you know, and is it a Mediterranean versus Northern Europe? I, I just don't know um, how it got that way. Or maybe they just didn't know that they drank beer back then. Um, or maybe yeah. I, maybe that's, you know, sort of the the bottom or line. How uh, how a, uh, you know, a, a unicorn versus a rhinoceros or, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, could have been a translation. Yeah. So um, beer has basically been around a long time, right? It's yes. been around since the dawn of civilization. People would, they would, um, some argue that you know it it's behind the neolithic revival or the neolithic breakthrough i i forget what the theory is called but you know that um in order to to stop being hunter gatherers and settle down and cultivate you know mm -hmm. they wanted to cultivate beer not grains um either way whatever the case is let people debate that um you know I'm, i don't know that we have enough data to determine one way or another but it's a nice thought right like mm -hmm. who wants a sandwich when you can you know, drink a pint. And um, okay, well, one way or another, it's been around for a long time. And, um, you know, we, we see it going back into Mesopotamia to Egypt. Um, not quite the beer we have today, as mm -hmm. far as you know, what would distinguish that? So beer over time has, um, it's really tied to the people that were making it. And uh, there has always been a close connection between uh, beer and bread. And so, for example, in, um, in Mesopotamia, uh, you know, they actually had, um, you know, this poem to Ninkasi, uh, this hymn. And uh, Ninkasi was the goddess, Sumerian goddess of, uh, of brewing. And a lot of the times they would, you know, first, you know, bake bread, get it wet, and then, you know, make beer out of it. And so there's always been this close tie to that. So at, at that point, you know, they wouldn't necessarily know how, um, how beer is made. They would know that, you know, if you get these grains wet, they germinate. The, um, the, the soup of grain and, you know, and water gets sweeter with time. As, those, uh, you know, as we know now, those starches break down into, uh, into sugars. And then eventually um, they wouldn't know why but it would start fermenting, it would start foam, it would start being alive. And um, if they you know, were using the same uh, stirring stick, the same uh, brewing vessels, uh, maybe using some of a previous batch to make the next batch, like you know, a lot of people do with sourdough culture, 
they would start to get more consistent batches. And over time, uh, beer got spiced. You'd have other things. And so at its simplest, I would say that beer is a alcoholic beverage that uh, as its source material, uh, it is uh, using a starch uh, as, the, as the sugar source. And so, um, you know, you go forward in time, uh, you know, you get to Germany. Uh, well, I mean, before Germany and before, you know, hops were being cultivated, you've got ale in uh, Britannia. And there they're using a um, mix of spices. Well, what's, uh, it, you know, before yeah, yeah. you get into that, like um, the, what's funny, as I was thinking about the hymn you mentioned, uh, one of the early translations of that um, mm-hmm. said it was wine, but like everything else since then translates that Sumerian word as beer, um, m- mostly because if I'm not mistaken, uh, they find it, you know, in parallel with shikaro, the the word that we know as beer. Um, okay. You know, and, and that's another thing. Um, I guess we can come come back to the ale discussion because I'm I'm confused about the difference between beer and ale and mead and lager and whatever, what are all these terms? And, you know, is beer an Uber term? Is it like an umbrella um, for this stuff? A lot determines uh, how we define things based on taxes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for, for example, uh, sake, you know, that uses a grain rice as its source material. If you brew it in America, is taxed as a beer. And so what do you know? You end up having a lot of um, sake um, breweries in California. You know, you, you tend to have the people that, uh, you know, uh, grew up or, you know, uh, you know, had the culture of sake. There you know, a lot of them in, in California. So, you know, you end up having those, those breweries there. If you import it from Japan, it's being taxed as a, uh, as a wine, ah. you know? So, uh, if uh, in, in, in some places, uh, you know, at some times, uh, you know, beer in, in um, Britain, they might tax you based on how big your brewing vessel is. And yeah. so what do you do? You figure out how to make that brewing vessel as, as uh, efficient as possible. So um, and, in, and in the case of ale, um, that was a beer made with uh, a, a spice called well, a mix of spices called root, whereas and that was controlled by the authorities and able to be taxed. And so in some cases that might be the only approved, um, you know, local, um, uh, what we would call beer. Whereas uh, beer, you know, spelled like by B-I-E-R yeah. or a derivative of that, that'd be coming from Germany where they're doing hops. And so you don't want to use, have beer that's not able to be taxed by the local authorities. <laughs> and so a lot of definitions is, is based on, um, on government intervention it's a lot like yeah, language even the law. right yeah you know it's um who's gonna interfere <laughs> so i mean i guess on the sake end i hadn't thought about that before but rice is a grain right and thus yeah it, it's i think you def- that's how you defined it right any alcoholic right. beverage derived from a grain that's how that's how i'm defining it you know so like in, in, even uh you know going back to college uh the, the good old cheap boons farm uh, that's, you know, uh, you might think that's a, a wine, at least, uh, if, if you're a college student, uh, but then you look at the bottle and it says, um, a malt beverage. And what are they doing is they're basically using, um, in that case, probably, uh, you know, cause we're in America, corn that they're converting to sugar in a, an industrial setting. And then, you know, so mixing that with water and, uh, uh, basically making ethanol that they then, you know, flavor and dilute. Um, and it's not going through a distillation. And so that's, oh. that's the other key thing is it's, it's, it's not being distilled. It's, um, uh, you know, not being, uh, yeah, yeah. Not being distilled. So that the distillation process is basically where we draw the line between hard and soft liquor. Would that be right? Or is there more to that, it? That would be right. Um, you know, but then again, taxes in America, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we don't, um, you know, if something is, you could freeze a beer, remove the ice. And uh, that's not really what they do with ice beer. Uh, but ice beer, uh, as in the actual German, um, you know, uh, spelling ice beer and over in 
Europe, uh, that's what they would do is they would freeze it. They would remove the water. It's a concentration of the alcohol. Um, I'll call it cold fractionation. You know, you're freezing it. You're now able to separate the two, two elements. Uh, and in America, that would be considered a, now a, a, a spirit. Uh, whereas in, mm. uh, like in Scotland, there's a company, I think it's called Turbo Dog. One of their big th- uh, things to get uh, informate uh, to get uh, publicity on social media was they would go to you know get a b- bunch of beer, go to this ice cream factory, freeze it down, remove the ice, and then uh, sell it as uh, you know a fifty one percent alcohol beer. And look, we got the strongest beer in the world, and it's like, well, yeah, because their laws allow that. Where in America, um, it would not be classified as spirit. Yeah. Okay. So does it have to yield natural alcohol? Like why, why does it have such a high percentage? Um, you in, know. in um, what Turbo Dog was doing? Yeah, right. Sure. Uh, well, what they were doing is if you, by freezing it, now you just have ice, which is just water. Yeah. And so you've got the water that you remove from the rest of the beer, which is going to be alcohol and, you know, sugars and flavors and other things. And so now uh, you've just, you know, if, if you remove, you know, let's say you've got um, something that's, you know, 20, uh, let's say it's 10% alcohol and 90% uh, water, and you then remove, um, you know, 10% water. Um, this is math at that point. Yeah. 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 Now, now, now it's got more and more alcohol. And you keep doing that over and over. Interesting. Yeah. You're, you're talking about all these, like, you know, you don't think about, the the role of the the overlords in in the the craft yeah. right of of making something like beer or uh, i mean this is food right this is a food a food and beverage right like and yet um you know like things like language uh, it's delineated sometimes by your border by mm-hmm. <laughs> who's in charge and what taxes they're taking or what laws they have they have tariffs and things like that um in the ancient world, beer was a commodity, right? So it's not just a good, but um, it, it's something moved, right? Moved and traded, and they would pay in beer and, and things like that. And um, yeah, and, and it was it was a cottage industry. It was something that could be done in the home. Uh, a lot of the times, the uh, brewers, um, you know, when it was done in the home, it would be like cooking. So it would be, um, you know, the the mother of the household. She'd be the one making the beer, or well, you know, her with the uh, you know with her daughters, and it's not until it really becomes more industrialized uh, does it go go from being a you know woman led in the home to being more of a um, an industrialized um, trade, uh, let's say that you know would be more than the men's um, in the men's domain. In um... I don't know if we're referring to the same thing, but I had read in Iraq, you know, they had excavated a number of homes and they had mm-hmm. found beer pits, you know, where, where they had found earthen vessels that are sure. halfway submerged in the earth. And I guess that, you know, was for, um, you know, there's no refrigerators or, you know, there's, it, it's not just sitting out on the counter, let's say, right. Like it keeps it cooler. And um, yeah, I mean, it seemed to be in every home just about. And okay. like every home has its own brewery, <laughs> you know, or really as a pot, right? Like um, some kind of bread, you know, is thrown in there. And yeah. um, I think in a previous conversation, we had talked about uh, bread water, you know, or, or <laughs> what was the term you I, used? Bread soup? I bread don't know. Stew? Yeah, I just, pre- yeah, I uh, previously I, uh, in our conversation, I think I called it a, a malt, uh, malt soup. But yeah, like if, if you're in prison, uh, they'll find ways to make alcohol out of anything. <laughs> and so if you can make a, uh, um, you can actually use bread as a source of, of your yeast. And then if, you know, you got something else laying around to ferment it, um, you know, you, you get everyone, you can get by. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, you know, I, I have, I have some thoughts on, beer development just i mean it's not really thoughts on beer development now that i said it out loud um but like i am curious 
how in other podcasts I've talked about this too, but how geography impacts things mm-hmm. like this. And so um, in certain parts of the ancient world, grains grow and vines mm-hmm. don't. Right. Mm-hmm. And so you see all across, you know, whatever the literature is, because, you know, we're, we're in the ancient world, at least we're piecing together the story from the data, right. Whatever's left over. So mm-hmm. sometimes you look at, you know, the ancient law codes. Sometimes you look at um, receipts, right. Mm-hmm. Sometimes yeah. um, you see hymns and things like that, that, you know, or they're, they're call them liturgical documents, but they're ritual practice and Mm -hmm. there will be different libations, but is everyone libating the same? Are they libating the same drink? Are they taking in the same drink? Do they have the same sort of bacchanal? I think in in the U S we've got that, that same sort of issue, right? Like we're kind of a beer society, um, but we like wine too. And Mm -hmm. um, are there trends for when, like one is more popular than the other? Well, you know, technology plays a big role. And um, wine, uh, you know, uh, so, sorry for the, all, the, all the analogists out there, because um, I'm, I'm not going to do them justice. Uh, but uh, wine is, is easy to make. Uh, it's probably tough to, to perfect, and I'm not, um, I'm not a, vine, uh, a wine expert. But, you know, with wine, you're taking a um a, a fruit juice you're taking a fruit the sugar is already there available you are then crushing it and uh it'll ferment on its own um you know it may not turn out well uh luckily with technology we can ensure that you know the wine will turn out the way the way we'd want it to turn out but uh you know you're adding the cultures from the skin of the of the of the um grapes from the people's feet that they're stopping it uh, the vessels uh, that they're fermenting it, uh, and so uh, it, it, you end up with wine naturally. With with beer, uh, you need to go and have you need to have germinated, uh, you know, uh, barley or, or grains, uh, you know, grass seed basically. Uh, have it germinate, so you got the enzymes that'll break down the starches into sugars. You got to have a way to heat that up. And so if you're up in, you know, Germanic lands at a certain point, they're going to have more woven baskets. Uh, so how do you not burn your baskets? Well, in their case, they would heat up hot rocks and then put it in and, you know, they would heat up the water, but it would never, uh, you know, basically the hot rocks wouldn't burn the, uh, the basket. And so that's how they could make beer there, stone beer. Uh, you know, so it's, it, it really depends on what technology they have available and, you um, and uh, also the, the local area. So in, in places that are more wine, that we consider more wine regions, you know, uh, Italy, France, uh, you're gonna have more of a wine culture. You start going into uh, Belgium and all of a sudden their beers, well, they take on a, um, a, a wine-like character. You know, they're your lambics, where they're adding, um, or, or uh, uh, cerise, where they're actually adding fruit juice, in that case, some cherry juice to the beer. And so it's taken on these, uh, these wine notes. And then you start going into, you know, Germany and, and more of the colder areas. And yeah, it's going to end up being more of a, uh, what we consider a true beer uh, or, you know, what, you know, it's not, not, not uh, as fruity. It's, uh, it's not like this one where you've got, you know, fanciful marketing, but it's uh, you know, just a you know, beer in a pint glass. But even then, you know, for the longest time, they could have dealt with, with, um, with uh, cloudy beer. Well, this isn't very, this isn't very uh, clear, uh, but as soon as you had gla- uh, glass that, uh, that you could actually see through and that was able to be produced at a, at a um, you know, so that, so that it wasn't just all hand blown, but, you know, the price came down and everyone was using glass. So it's like, well, now, now the clearest beers ended up being important. So, yeah, it, um, I don't remember what the question was, but I kind of rambled there. Uh, where how, the form that beer takes, and whether it's influenced by you know the wine culture or other uh, cuisines, hmm. uh, really depends on on the local culture. Uh, yeah, and I think between the geography and like you know the borders and and the the government you know oversight, um, 
you know, it, it's, there's a definite connection mm-hmm. to like the beer and the people, but not just the beer and the people, but the beer and the surroundings right. as well as the people. Uh, if, if you could say a little more about beer and culture. Sure. Uh, so uh, beer has been a, um, it's, it's liquid bread. So in some ways uh, it can be used as, you know, people are working out in the fields. Um, you know, you might actually have, you know, Egyptian records. I think I read this someplace, you know, the slaves were paid with a certain amount of beer, you know, and, and, uh, and so it was part of sustenance and that plate, that format would be more like a, a kvass and uh, part of the meal. And it would be a um, safe form of drinking water uh, as well with, with nutrients. Uh, and then as, you know, it became more industrialized. Uh, people were able to market it, uh, brew higher, uh, you know, they'd have a clientele that might want it in a certain way. I mean, if you're going to a pub and you want to go and, uh, be able to have a, it's called a session beer these days. Um, you know, but a session is, and you could drink a lot of them and not get drunk, uh, or, you know, uh, what I might call a lawnmower beer, you know, something that's just refreshing, something that you can still do work, but you're not, you know, after one beer, you're not getting you know drunk off your butt. Is that very like King of the yeah. Hill, you know? Yes. Yes. <laughs> or they're just standing out. Yeah. Cause like this one, um, you know, this one is six and a half, uh, al- uh, percent alcohol. This is the one I'm drinking right now. Uh, chaos pattern from hazy. It's a hazy IPA from three sheeps brewing in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I live in Wisconsin. I'm drinking local and, and it is, it is hazy. Um, you know, that one's some, you know, I'm, I'm, I want to be careful about having too many of those uh, because then I can't actually get work and can't, can't be safe. Uh, but then you've got uh, situations where it's treated more like a wine. Yeah. Uh, when Napoleon, when he uh, went into, uh, um, into Germany, I think it was the uh, Berliner Weiss. It's a white beer, a little tart, uh, white as in um, cloudy. Uh, it's okay. a beer. And, uh, you know, he called it a German champagne. So in that case, he's treating it as a, um, you know, whatever, whatever batch he had as something that uh, he would, you know, would be fit for, for his station. And you've got um, uh, uh, Catherine the Great with some very strong stouts uh, trading those that she preferred. And, you know, that's now a court drink. So it's, it, it's really a, a Compared to wine, I would say a beer is a more proletarian beer or a uh-huh. proletarian alcoholic drink, um, you know, one for, for the masses. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you can adapt it. And, uh, you know, if you want to, if you want to, uh, p- part of the reason you've got all these different fancy beers is to be able to, you know, I remember going to the Chicago Beer Society and, and uh, going to one of their meetings and I ended up getting cornered by the wrong people, you know, that just wanted to talk about everything they love, they knew about beer and prove how smart they are. And that's, that's part of what social settings sometimes are. And, you know, this is now an opportunity to say, Hey, look, look at how much I know about beer. Um, and uh, if, if you want to do that, there are some really good books out there tasting beer by, um, by uh, uh, Randy Mosher, a great beer that you can then go and talk about, some of the stuff that I'm talking about right now about how it was in this era or that era and, and, uh, and then show off to people. Uh, so that's some, some way it's, it's becoming a uh, modern setting is uh, got to have all the different microbrewers to go and show um, how sophisticated I am. And um, you know, if this, if this, if this pint glass hadn't been clean, I would have been drinking out of a mason jar, you know? So it's not, I'm not, I'm taking a different approach to, to my alcohol, I guess. But in, I think, you know, if you want to show off to the regular folks, um, it's enough for you to say that, hey, I used to get paid to, uh, to taste beer every day, right? I do. And you were a former beer taster. How, how, does, that, how does that even happen? Uh, so a little bit about my background. I, I am a, uh, I'm a food scientist, uh, but I didn't start out that way. I, I went to University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, started out in biochemistry, figured out uh, I'm going to get a PhD. I'm going to work in a laboratory. And then when I, you know, worked in a few labs and realized it wasn't for me, it was like, okay, well, no, I mean, uh, luckily it's, it's a fancy enough sounding degree. It's like, but I, I still need to do something with it. 
and uh, I went into the food industry. And so from in the food industry, um, I was in a, uh, in, in a company that makes uh, breadcrumbs and, and batters and breadings. And uh, I worked in deep fried food. Uh, so, uh, so after working with, with deep fried food, I uh, decided to work uh, in the beer industry. And, uh, and I was studying for my master's in food science at the same time. So uh, that was, uh, those were night classes. So I then went uh, into the beer industry and worked for one of the um, major American brewers and uh, was a, a production manager. Uh, so I was responsible for receiving the raw materials out to sending finished product to get bottled. And as part of that, uh, one of my responsibilities was to taste the beer. Mm-hmm. And so I've, uh, I had to take a breathalyzer every day. Good. I mean, you better, <laughs> right? If, you, if you're not taking the train well, home. <laughs> uh, d- definitely. Def- well, yeah, in that area, they didn't, there weren't too many trains, but uh, I could have walked. Uh, would have been a long walk. Uh, <laughs> Well, with, um, I don't live on this street. <laughs> uh, so yeah, after working in, uh, well, working in brewing, uh, we would have to taste every batch of beer. And so you're just taking a sip, uh, not drinking the whole thing. And, uh, because they had, um, a number of breweries in America, a number of breweries worldwide, uh, we'd get a, you know, batch of, of, um, a, a, you know, bottle of, of a certain type of their beer and we taste it we'd see, you know, how is this brewery making their beer? How is ours? It's, and, you know, what flavor, uh, you know, because in, in that case, you know, they're trying to make a standard product that's the same, uh, you know, at one point coast to coast, now worldwide, and they want it to be the same. And part of part of my job was to take notes and, mm-hmm. you know, mark it. And, uh, and then, you know, that would be uploaded to someone that would interpret them and decide, you know, how, how are the breweries actually, you know, how are they doing? Are they making the product the way that they, that uh, corporate expects? I imagine that's hard. You know, I've, I've been overseas and, um, you know, I've had uh, pick a fast food, um, Wendy's, Burger King, whatever, yeah, yeah. in multiple countries. And you have it like, uh, you have it in the country's environment mm-hmm. and it's not the same. And then you go on base and it, it's the same as America. Right. And so uh, I, I think about people from New York too, mm-hmm. and talking about pizza yeah. and, you know, things that might be indistinguishable to folks who aren't New Yorkers. Um, I'll lump New Jersey in there, but I know I'm going to get some, <laughs> some heat from that, but you know, like, is it the water? I, I've heard stories of people actually shipping water out to different locations outside of the city and, you know, it still is not working. Um, is it just the, the bitterness that New York puts you through and, and you know, it, it taking the slice when you're just miserable and hot and, you know, humid in the summer evening? I don't know. Um, <laughs> maybe not. But uh, I imagine that's a difficult task, you know, especially in light of what we said earlier about geography mm-hmm. and, um, you know, how all the little idiosyncrasies of the geography is going to play into the flavor. Mm-hmm. So well, how, you know, how... every that's part of the, that's part of the beauty of uh, where the beer industry is now is that you can have that variety and uh, you know, it, it, it's expected now. I mean, we, we went through an era in, in America where, um, you know, wonder bread was everywhere. Uh, you know, so you needed to have, you know, wonder bread versions of, of um, your, uh, um, of your beer. Uh, it, there, there is a really good book called uh, Prohibition Hangover, and it is about the effects of the of of prohibition on the American um, alcohol industries. You know, wine, spirits, beer, and so at one point you had, especially in the uh, the immigrant areas, you would mm-hmm. have uh, small, tiny breweries everywhere. Um, you know, they might only serve to the bar, you know, that they're, you know, so it's a, a brewery bar or modern brew pub. It was not, this isn't a, a, a new thing, mm-hmm. uh, or they might, you know, serve just to a few bars in the area. And then you had, uh, world war one come, well, you know, you had world war one come through and then you had prohibition and, uh, you know, there was a lot of anti, uh, German immigrant sentiment, and you combine that with, um, you know, you combine that with the, the uh, suffrage movement, movement 
and um, you combine it with um, you know uh, you know men having died overseas, so you got less men voting, you know, who would probably been consumers, and you had prohibition come through, and you destroyed. I mean, America destroyed all these small companies, you know, the ones that survived, uh, the Budweisers, the Millers. Um, they ended up converting to being malting, uh, um, you know, making malted or, or, or malted non-alcoholic beverages, mm-hmm. and uh, they were able to survive. But, you know, like, like we see with a lot of catastrophes, economic catastrophes, all the small guys get wiped out. And so then you have, um, you know, a, a bunch of competition and you end up getting a, a few uh, oligarchs that then control that industry. And it wasn't until, you know, uh, you know, I don't know, during the 70s, maybe that's when the, the, the microbrew, uh, you know, started to happen. Uh, you had people wanting to, you know, drink something different than uh, light American Pilsner. And, uh, you know, that's that's where it came from. But, you know, for the longest time, it was all, um, you know, <laughs> trying to make the same product and, or, you know, very similar product. And, uh, and the industry was just locked up. That, Yeah, I mean, whenever something goes from um, local to universal, mm-hmm. There's a lot of that, uh, uh, pun intended, I guess, flavor lost, yeah. right? I say nuance too much, but, um, you know, the, the particularities of that, that local tradition, um, mm-hmm. it's applicable to anything, right? So you can look at uh, the, you know, people's history, you could look at religion. And when things get universalized, a lot of the local um, expressions of things are... If I could use a, a wine term, terroir. Okay. You know, terroir that's, uh, is that uh, yeah. like bound to the bound to the earth? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know that that um, it's a bigger deal with when you've got viticulture there. Yeah. Uh, but there is a you know a local expression, uh, and in in beer, it's um, it's more of a, a chemical engineering project that versus uh, because. You have to manipulate the grains uh, to be uh, fermentable for the yeast, mm-hmm. and so there's a lot more. Uh, there's a lot more science and human intervention in making beer that you can make the same style of beer many places. Okay. Uh, these days, you know, and, and with you know, that's one. That's one of the benefits of globalism is you get exposed to yeah, a lot of different sure. Things. Uh, but you know, in 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 the case of we went through a period where it all ended up being, being the same. Yeah. And um, I wonder too, like, you know, I mean, this, I'm just in my examples, right. Whether it's pro wrestling um, going local to universal, sure. um, you know, WWF taking over the world, um, you know, or if it's languages, right. Like we see ourselves squeezing out not just local languages, but local dialects and local expressions yeah. of language. And, um, you know, we will accuse the those who have less of a population, maybe, mm-hmm. um, of not speaking correct X, Y, or Z. Let's say correct English, you know. Yeah. And so, a lot of the, you know, the local terms are just lost. Or, you know, I like the fact that you might go drink from the bubbler, and uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, the, the drinking fountain. You mean no, the bubbler. What's a drinking fountain? Like you drink out of a fountain? What's wrong with you? You, that, you some, put that some in the city people, square. Some people even call it a water fountain. It's like, you know, at least at least drinking fountain I can understand a little bit. But, <laughs> a water yeah, fountain. I grew, I, I grew up with, with Bubbler. And, um, you know, to, to, to give you an example of a language um, a situation, I went to the Faroe Islands and um, for, for vacation. And... I had just, I had just been in, uh, Iceland and in Iceland, you know, uh, you go to talk to one of the locals and they start t- talking to you in, in, um, English. And I'm, I'm thinking, uh, do I really stand out as that American that they right away go to English? But then I realized that they did the same thing to the Italians, to the Chinese, uh, that, you know, the, the, if they, they, there's only so many people on the Island that, you know, they, they pick you out pretty easily. And then they just go straight to Eng- English because, um, <laughs> It's the lingua franca, uh, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, but in, in uh, the Faroe Islands, 
the first thing they do, and this is part of um, them probably having learned to hold on to their culture. And uh, I believe Faroese is very similar to Icelandic um, just because uh, they didn't have as much interaction with um, other languages and, you know, kept on to it uh, for, you know, unadulterated for longer. But, you know, first they go and speak to you in Faroese. It's like, I'm sorry, I don't speak Faroese. So I'm thinking, you know, I just spoke to you in English saying I don't speak. I think they switched to English. No, they speak, then switched switch to Danish because they're technically a protectorate of, of, of uh, Denmark. Huh. And so it's like, oh, okay, I, I get it. I'm not used to having to go through a couple languages to get to English. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I'm used to them just going straight to English. Well, hope, you know, hopefully you weren't there for the grind, uh, but you know, if, um, yeah, if you say, <laughs> say as much, that's, that's definitely a locale. Like yeah. they, they probably aren't, I don't know, maybe they would. Um, they're probably going to have their own stuff, right? Like you go to some of these islands, you know, in different um, parts of the world and maybe you just can't get the mainstream things because it costs too much to move right. them there. And so you're dependent on the local, you know, whatever the local version is. Did you experience that with the beer? Yes. Uh, so in Hawaii, um, there is a, I think it's Maui Brewing. Uh, they've got Kona, Kona Brewing there as well. But uh, I remember Maui Brewing. They made a big deal. So it wasn't for a, for a while. Um, it was very unusual to see microbrews in cans. Mm -hmm. uh, with with can technology, there is a polymer on the inside that prevents the beer from interacting with the metal. Uh, so that's why you know we don't yeah. get metallic flavors anymore. But for the longest time, people remembered, well, you know, you, know, you drink out of out of a, a can of beer and it's going to taste metallic. Uh, or if um, you know they, they were associating higher class beers coming out of a bottle. And, um, you know, the American uh, Pilsners coming out of a can. And so uh, the microbrewing world had, excuse me, differentiated themselves uh, going with, with bottles. And Molly Brewing, they, are, uh, they made a big deal of they would only serve beer in cans. Well, chances are it's expensive to have packaging um, mm -hmm. material, uh, equipment. You're only going to pick one or the other, cans or bottles. And they marketed as such as hey, our beer is in a can because we care about the beaches. <laughs> you, will not have, you will not have broken um, glass uh, on the beaches. And, and, you know, there's other things that that's, you know, maybe they got local laws saying that, you know, you can't have uh, uh, glass on the beaches, um, you know, but these also chill down quicker. So yeah. that's an example of a, uh, uh, of a situation where, where they were using um, um, probably a constraint you know, you can only take one packaging material and they, they went with cans to, to differentiate themselves, you know, and, and uh, you go into Mexico, uh, a lot of their, a lot of their heritage, you know, you look at the music, the beer and the cheese, uh, they're getting a lot of that from German uh, immigrants that had gone there. And so Modelo is really more of a, uh, uh, you know, uh, they, they have their, their, uh, you know, heritage in, in probably Germany with the, how the beer was made and the, the different yeast. Well, Modelstein. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 you know, they, you know, you listen to, to, to uh, Mexican uh, music and you got that uh, uh, tuba or that, that, the bass note that yeah, right. opa, that sounds like Mexican polka. And, uh, and so you can see how they would have that heritage. And but it's still not German beer. You know they've they've adapted it in, in, in certain ways. Um, I get a little bit of a of a green apple note. That's probably you know because of how they fermented the beer. Um, got a little bit of acetaldehyde, which is a green apple flavor uh, that was being produced naturally by the yeast. And uh, you know they probably just decided, well, this is our our you know our our heritage, or this is what people expect. Uh, they now have the technology that you they could avoid that, but you know yeah. they, they that's now part of uh, what identifies that beer. And, and, and I'm mixing out my, my beers here, but there are certain Mexican beers that I get more of that green apple flavor out of. Interesting. Uh, like that, that kind of nails it for me in a way. And I think, you know, if I, um, if I were to learn something or, or, or have a takeaway and think about beer in a new way from this conversation, I'd say, um, I know your culture by the beer you make and drink. Right. Mm -hmm something like that, you know, like where 
Um, I think you had you told me previously that beers like language. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, beer, the beer is like language and, um, it, it adapts to, um, you know, it changes over time and it adapts and it's, um, you know, it's, it's brings people together, people, you know, whether, whether you're out working, whether it's, um, you know, a festivity, whether it's, um, you know, a family dinner and having some beer over family dinner, uh, it is a social, uh, it's a social event. I guess one of the things I wanted to um figure out in part of the process you know has to do with the malting yeah, because yeah. as a food scientist you know beer is not the only thing you malt right no Excuse yeah that's it. you gotta yeah. get her done uh, <laughs> you know there's this i i had read something about an enzyme to starch ratio and that i, I don't know how um consistent that needs to be for things like beer but what number one what sort of things go through the malting process and why is it important and then you know how does that impact our our local beers so malt uh, is barley that has been allowed to germinate and so once it's germinated you know you got these little sprouts that are growing and uh it, it is getting ready to go into uh into growth mode and grow into a, a whole new plant but once it's in that very early stage, um, it's then heated up and, uh, and it could, how they heat it up, how they dry it, um, you know, are they, are they uh, using high temperature, uh, low temperature for a long time, or, um, you know, even using uh, with some moisture there so that you result in some different caramelization reactions that are happening, uh, different Mallard browning pathways. Uh, a lot of what's happening in the beer glass is not happening by the brewer himself. It's happening by the maltster. And then the brewmaster has to decide how is he going to blend various different malts together. Uh, one of the biggest technology changes was when they were able to have the technology to, to, to measure brewing efficiency. You know, how much beer are they getting out of, out of what, they're, um, what they're putting in for malt? Then they started changing from using a sin single malt, you know, just a, a, a standard brown malt to using a mixture of malts. And so you'll have one malt that its whole purpose is to have a lot of enzymes and, um, you know, a lot of starch, but not, not a lot of flavor. Mm -hmm. And uh, you'll have more of that in, in a, a Pilsner and you'll have less of that in maybe a stout, but you'll still have that there. And so the purpose of that malt is to provide both starch and the enzymes to go and um, break down the starch into sugars. The yeast, which is actually, you know, the organism that makes uh, the alcohol, it cannot consume starch. Starch is these long molecules mm -hmm. uh, of all these little sugar molecules added together. And uh, what it does is breaks it down into maltose, which is uh, two combined molecules of glucose. And depending on um, what temperature you go and hold your wort at, which is your malt soup, uh, you can pick for different enzymes to be active, more active than others. So you've got one enzyme that consistently t chops off two molecules at a time of, uh, off, that, um, off that starch molecule of glucose. And as is a maltose um, uh, sugar. And that's going to all be, I mean, a lot of that's going to be turned into alcohol. You've got these other starches that um, it's like trying to mow your lawn with a weed whacker. It's not going to do a good job. It's just go, right. cutting around uh, randomly. And so those m won't be able to be broken down by the, um, by the yeast, but that will provide your body. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's what is happening from your malt selection. And then you'll have a little bit of malt that is going to add your flavors. You know, do I want it to, to be very caramely? Do I want it to be very malty? Do I want it to have um, certain flavors? And then you've got another ones that are, let's say, heavier roasted. And, uh, you know, your black patent malt, uh, where, you know, a lot of the times, let's say you're drinking a coffee stout, but they probably just put a little bit of coffee in there because coffee is yeah. expensive. Yeah. But if you put burnt malt basically in there, 
that has a lot of the same flavor as as coffee. Well, now you can call it a coffee stout because you just do a dash of coffee, but you're probably getting a lot of that flavor from that burnt malt. So how you're combining that is going to determine your, your malt flavors, your color. Um, and, and that's the big thing with, with Porter. Porter was probably the first in truly industrialized beer. And part of that was they were combining, you know, at least three different malts rather than trying to use a single malt. And that's what set them apart from the other beers. Is it always related to flavor? Uh, so one of the things that I do not know uh, anything about, but would be useful for me in, in some of the stuff I do is, um, you know, the beer chemistry, you know, or, or yeah. the, the science behind it. Is it always related to flavor? I mean, I guess it makes sense in terms of industry or, you know, why people do it. They're in business yeah. to sell product. And so it's related to flavor. But I wonder um, what other sorts of compounds you know, um, are made in, in such processes. And like, I know, you know, beer is, you mentioned earlier, um, how it's a safe way to drink in the ancient world. Right. Uh, well, even in the modern world, uh, Britain for a while, they decided to really promote the beer industry to keep people away from gin. To keep people away from exercise. Gin. Oh, gin. Okay. You, know, <laughs> you know, gin and, 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 uh, you know, and, and then when there was opium, then they were probably using gin as an excuse not to go to opium. <laughs> so it's the, it's the opposite of a gateway drug. It's the, <laughs> yes, the, yes. It's closing the, the doors. The, the acceptable vice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, <laughs> well, beyond that, you know, just thinking back to like clean drinking, right. Killing um, microbes or whatever might be harmful you know, through whatever the alcoholic content is, is one of the reasons why it's been such a human staple for so many generations and millennia. Um, and I, but beer is more than that, right? Like it, it produces certain compounds that are um, medicinally helpful. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and sometimes we like, well, we don't know, we didn't know what they were until recently. And, you know, people could do analysis of what the compounds were like, you know, um, antibiotics, right. Tetracycline yeah. is produced and they, they found all those Sudanese mummies that were jacked full of um, tetracycline because, you know, they've been drinking, Sure, <laughs> but they're drinking water. Like it's, that's their water, right? Like it's mm -hmm. not, um, that they're drinking, you know, beer instead of water because they like to, to party. Um, it's just a better choice. You know, if you have a contaminated water and you have an uncontaminated beer, or at least something that can, um, you know, um, keep you from those potential pathogens. Um, and then in others, like I had seen that, um, you know, beer also produces nitrous oxide and, you know, that evidently is a, um, a, a relaxer for the blood vessels and, it, you know, vasodilator. Yeah. A vasodilator. Exactly. And so, you know, that has numerous, you know, uh, positive impacts for, specific conditions, you know, let's say blood pressure, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you can release that, um, your pressure is going to go down and that's going to, you know, have a, a, a snowball effect, you know, or chain reaction is kind of what I want to say, but not always. Um, but, you know, it, it impacts other systems, right? And mm -hmm. when you can fix one thing, um, it tends to fix those other things that then emerged those other um, elements of dis-ease, that emerge um, as a result of maybe one or two base conditions. And so I just, I don't know enough about the, the chemistry of beer, but it's one of those, you know, interesting things for someone like me who does ancient medicine. Sure. And um, we, we have to kind of hunt based on the evidence. We have to, um, you know, we, we don't, we don't even know sometimes like we know wine is used against glaucoma and things like that. And, you know, we know people have an intentionality with their application of the, uh, whatever the pharmacopoeia is, you know, in mm -hmm. applying it or utilizing it against X, Y, or Z conditions. But sometimes you just don't know. Right. And, right. and you can't know, um, especially if it's something like beer is so prevalent you know, that you don't necessarily need it medicinally all the time mm -hmm. because you have it all the time. Right. 
It's like growing up eating oranges all the time and you're not getting scurvy because you just, you never even thought of it. You never encountered it. You know, you can't measure that. Um, but you can say failure. this region, you know, does the, the skeletal remains don't attest to that, you right. know, but in Britain, you know, the sailors, at least it was highly problematic. Those limeys. Indeed. Our limey friends. <laughs> well, yeah, we're friends with everybody. <laughs> well, you know, and, and they were called limeys because they were uh, part of their ration was some lime. So they would, you know, have the uh, nutrients to avoid getting, getting scurvy. That's it. So, so with, um, with beer, uh, I mean, part of it is we, we are in a very um, litigious and uh, technocratic environment Yeah, that uh, it, you would be very hard pressed to find uh, a brewer, especially as the alcohol industry is, is very regulated um, mostly to make sure that the right people get, get their money. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So, so or the wrong people. <laughs> well, you know, like like for example, uh, I was at a I was at a um, brewery that made non-alcoholic beer, mm -hmm. and so basically to make non-alcoholic beer that actually tastes like beer, uh, you basically use a distillation process, and instead of keeping the alcohol, you you get rid of the alcohol. And it was at such levels that it didn't necessarily make sense to try to sell it for other reasons. And so we had to provide evidence that not going down the drain, you know, to make sure so that our non-alcoholic beer wasn't being taxed as an alcoholic product. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, a, lot, a lot depends on, on, um, on the environment because you, you look at some of the old um, artwork for, um, for Guinness, uh, you know, the, the nice classic stuff where you've got, you know, Guinness, Guinness gives you strength and it, and it has the, um, the farmer, who is, you know, in one scene, he's riding, uh, he, he's in the wagon and the horse is pulling it, um, like big old Clydesdale, a draft horse. Yeah. And then, you know, afterward, they show him lifting up the horse and, you know, pulling the, cause so that he, when he goes over a toll bridge, he doesn't have to pay a toll because they're charging people based on how, how many horses they have, <laughs> <laughs> you know? So that's, that's um, you know, or when doctors, they were able to advertise, yeah, uh, so many doctors uh, recommend Guinness to nursing mothers. Yeah, and you know, it makes sense. It's it's you know, it's probably a natural um, letdown. Probably maybe ties into even oxytocin in some way, uh, which is is tied. To, I, I grew up on a on a dairy farm, so letdown. I'll let you use your imagination what that means, but um, I won't. I'll, I'll tell you. Yeah, it, 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 it's something that you need for a cow in order to go and release milk, and yeah. and uh, the same thing for a nursing mother. Um, and so they were actually prescribing it, um, or recommending, uh, Guinness to, to nursing mothers. You'll be very hard pressed to find many advertising agencies recommending stuff like that these days. <laughs> um, and, and you could be sued if you, if you do it. So yeah, as far as the benefits of, of beer and, um, I, I'll give you, I'll give you, um, I had, I had a, a professor who, who, one time told me that, Hey, if, if, if you're trying to get your vitamin C from raw milk, and that's why you're not pasteurizing milk, maybe you should fix your diet before you try to, uh, <laughs> get, get so fancy with what you're choosing for, for your milk. And, um, so that, mm -hmm. that would be, so I wouldn't say you want to necessarily rely on beer for, for, uh, nutrients, but a few things to consider is if you go and drink a, a, a filtered beer, uh, an American Pilsner, um, the, the ones that are, you know, very, you know, like, like even this one, um, this is now uh, that fantasy factory. It's a little cloudy. Um, they might've filtered it. Um, but, uh, with this type of beer, they're allowed to have a little bit of haze. Uh, if you're filtering it, that means you're removing all the yeast, mm -hmm. which have some nutrients. Um, not everyone necessarily likes when they drink, if you've ever had home brewed beer, um, if you pour all of it in, you're going to, going to get that little last at the bottom. That's all the sediment and particulate. And that doesn't necessarily taste very well, but if you wanted to go and make sure to get your full nutrients out of the beer, you're going to make sure that you get something that's unfiltered and you're going to get, you know, you're going to drink it to the last drop, even if it's that, you know, that sludge on the bottom, because that's where you're going to have your, your yeast and your, your components that the, the micro, um, the, the uh, microbes made that only they can make and maybe um, some particulates that um, 
precipitated out, but would be uh, would be beneficial. So uh, I guess that's something to to consider. But you know, I'm not a doctor; can't give medical advice. And um, you know, you can probably find some good stuff on the web to look that up. Uh, but you're not going to find um, someone in the industry saying, "Yeah, we're um, you know drink drink this," you know, because it'll help it'll help you. And yeah, that's smart. Like you know, I, I one of the things I wanted to to discuss is um, you know in that vein, namely like avoiding the litigious aspect of um, or recommending anything. We're not recommending right. anything, but in the event of an apocalypse. Um, we have <laughs> learned from the past these things about beer yep. that are beneficial, that are useful, that um, you know for for health, for survival, for calorie intake and nutrient intake. You know, it's loaded with antioxidants, B vitamins, mm-hmm. right? Like it's a, it, it's useful. Um, and so, it, is it something that you know we should go back to, like in the um, you know, ancient Mesopotamia, Sumerian, you know, world and, and brew our own. I mean, we can't recommend that. I don't know. Maybe we can. I don't know. But if you're doing it right, sure. We're not telling you how to do it, I guess. And that would be the uh, <laughs> the, the Bre- line yeah. to cross. Um, bre- brewing beer is, is fun. Um, I, you know, when I, when I got into it, um, I, I started it in college. And, you know, I'm taking all these biochemistry classes and, and uh, one of the unfortunate things about some of these science, uh, science degrees is unless you can tie it to the real world, um, it's just all theoretical. You know, that's one of the dangers with um, modern um, advanced education, uh, you know, uh, versus like, let's say the trades is your, your theory and your practicum are, are oftentimes separated. And so uh, I liked it because it was like, oh my gosh, these, these certain things I'm learning, I'm, I'm holding you know, this beer at this time, or this um, wort, uh, which is the mash, um, uh, wort is just the German German name for it, at this temperature for this length of time, because then the enzyme is active. And then I'm heating it up to this temperature so that I kill any microbes and I deactivate enzymes. You know, I was like, oh, wow, this, this all makes, this all makes uh, sense now. So it's, it's, it's fun for that. Because I'm a food scientist, though, it didn't end up becoming too close to work for me. Mm, um, it's yeah. like I, I did this, you know, I lived this. And so I, I kind of uh, got away from brewing my own beer. But uh, in, you know, the way, you know, it's, it's so easy to, to access. So I would, I would recommend make, being friends with someone that makes their own beer. <laughs> you know, uh, that's, that's the best way. It's, it's kind of like um, owning, a, owning a boat sucks, but it's great to be friends with someone that owns a boat. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great point. You you need yeah. people who can move commodities in your network too, right? Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, this uh, you know this could be valuable. I mean, you trade for supplies and <laughs> and and all. Um, you know, I'm not sure if you'll bring me back for for anything else, but like for um... I'm going to bring you back for cheese. You're raised on a dairy farm, <laughs> so I know you know a lot about cheese. We make cheese at home. Um, oh, you do? Know, okay. It's a, yeah, it's a common. Um, it is a. Uh, sorry one sec it's a common middle eastern thing to like have a syrian cheese you know or a syrian cheese or middle uh, eastern cheese i don't know my cheese very well but uh levna is that the um um lebanon yeah, Lebne? Lebne, Lebne, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah so we'll talk about cheese when i have you back um unless you want to if, if we've got beer part two but um <laughs> but um well yeah there's there's more because we haven't even gotten into how how beer is actually made but uh, one thing to consider about all fermentation is yeah. it's all it's it's preservation. Um, that there's a number of different um, a number of different practices that we use to preserve food, and now we've industrialized these. And sometimes we're at the point where we got you know f- uh, refrigerators and freezers that we don't even realize that these uh, practices were for preservation purposes. But um, fermentation acidification, heating, cooling, uh, smoking, uh, salting. Uh, these are all forms of preservation. And in the case of beer, you got a combination of these. If it's, uh, you, you can have smoked beer. Um, I, I'm not going to say it goes and preserves it anymore. It's flavor probably is, um, you know, because <clears throat> your malt would have been a big thing for malt was once they had uh, uh, Coke kilns uh, that were uh, smokeless, 
Well, all of a sudden you had um, beer that didn't taste like smoke. So that was a big deal. You know, there's all these technolo technological advances. But with beer, you've got the alcohol production from the fermentation. Um, you probably have also some um, antibacterial uh, properties that are being created. If it's a multiple strand beer, uh, you might even have a little bit more diversity of things. Um, after L Louis Pasteur, a lot of beers end up going to a single strand because it was, you could control the fermentation better. But for most of history, you had multiple strands and bacteria and yeast all mixed together um, and not just a single strand. Uh, you have spices. Spice is another uh, preservation method. But in beer, uh, modern beer, the spice of choice is, is um, hops. Hops is technically a, a, a spice. And if you look at like, um, well, like a rosemary, like rosemary um, that has preservative properties. In fact, they have rosemary extracts that they remove most of the flavor. And then you have mostly of a, um, the, the active ingredients that are really um, um, preservative. Then you can add that to different, pro uh, different food products and not overwhelm someone with a rosemary flavor, but you still have the properties and then it goes on the label as a natural flavor. And so it's a natural preservative. It, you know, people don't even know, you know, how, you know, someone who's anti-preservative, right. uh, they'll be consuming something that actually has a natural preservative that is coming from, from rosemary. Same thing with hops. Uh, hops has, uh, 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 so if you want a beer that is going to last you a long time, it's going to be high in alcohol. It's going to have a lot of hops. And, um, you know, and of course it's going to be, um, and then there, there's a drop in, um, in pH, there is an acidification process that that's happening. And, uh, and, you know, part of that is the, the carbonic acid part of that is other things that are being, that are going on. Uh, but if you have a, a, a beer that's like a lambic where it's actually purposely creating acid, yeah. well, that beer can last for a very long time. And then you got Goza, which is a Polish beer, uh, that, uh, they're actually salting it. So you can combine lots of different things uh, in all food products, but even beer to have it last a long time. Wow. There's a, there, it seems like there is a, a lot to learn, you know, still so uh, with beer. I know I grew up around a, uh, a place where, you know, they offer beer degrees, <laughs> a master's in beer. Oh but, yeah. 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 UC Davis. Yeah. 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 yeah, so. yeah I, I, uh, I, I looked at that program, but uh, yeah. Um, well, I mean, you know, you look at it, uh, you're like, I don't know, I want to go into beer. Um, there's lots of different pathways. You don't necessarily need one of those degrees, but, um, you know, if, if, it's a, it's a, if it's a passion and you're in that area, you know, that's one way to do it is to, you know, actually go to school and get it. But, uh, you know, I, uh, most, most colleges have a food science degree. And so, uh, you know, I got a master's in food science uh, that, and a lot of those, you know, you can get online now these days. Okay. Uh, you know, so for uh, working professionals, if you, the thing about the food industry, you have a lot of people that worked in different areas and ended up in the food industry, not knowing that they'd end up there. And so then, you know, you get your master's and that's one way to, uh, to make it in the, in the brewing world. Interesting. Yeah. Well, you know, definitely. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I learned a lot, um, but there's still a lot to learn. Uh, do you have any plugs or, you know, um, lasting have, thoughts that you want to uh, leave us with? I mean, I, I know we could talk more uh about beer <laughs> but maybe you know do a we'll need a live session where we we go through a tutorial and, and uh, watch the effects real time <laughs> well um i have no social media i uh, i got rid of all that uh so um, you're probably a more stable human being as a result <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've gone through withdrawals it is it is its own own addiction um and i just uh, I didn't, I didn't, uh, drink alcohol during Lent. So, um, now I'm just, this, this is actually, I think, uh, beyond, uh, Pasca night, this is probably the first, first beer I've had since, uh, since Lent. <laughs> get, get her done, man. Well, I'm, I'm a bad influence. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I guess, I guess the only thing is, um, if people have questions, um, if they want to learn about a certain item, uh, you know, send them to, uh, Michael. And if there is enough, uh, interest in doing uh, it for a certain category, even if I'm not necessarily, uh, it's in my wheelhouse. There's been yeah. a lot of things that have been in my wheelhouse, but if it's not, uh, I can at least talk uh, semi-educated and then uh, you know, let you guys uh, fill, in, fill in the gaps. 
All right. I like it. We love it. Thank you so much uh, for, for the education and for the conversation. And, um, you know, I'm all out. So you're going to have to have another one for me. <laughs> well, I, I'll finish this and then I'm calling it a night. <laughs> all right. Sounds good, my friend. All right. All thank right. you much. Take care. Have a good evening.